weekend, everyone. It's great to see all of you. Uh, for those of you who do currently, or for those of you who have served in our country's armed forces, we honor you and we are grateful for your service. Thank you. Let's begin our time of worship today with our call to worship. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who has scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from, the hand, from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the heights of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord. With that hope in our hearts, let's stand and let's sing hymn number 43, Great is Thy Faithfulness. of the church 
we call upon you as your people. To get, today we gather. Mold us into a true spiritual and physical body of Christ. We cannot imagine what it would be like without the church, the leaven of righteousness, the good news of salvation from sin. Thank you that you preside over your church through temptation and through prosperity. Today, help us respond as your people so that the world may believe and know that you love each person and have sent Christ the Savior. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord. I would like to welcome all of the visitors yeah, um, who have come to worship with us this morning, either here or online. Uh, everyone is invited to join in some refreshments and conversation downstairs immediately after the service. Uh, this month has been hosted by the Board of Trustees, so thank you for that, Trustees. If anyone would like to host Fellowship Hour, maybe to celebrate a special day uh, a special day in your family, an anniversary, a birthday, anything like that, you can sign up on the calendar next to the kitchen door. Um, if you are wondering what hosting entails, come and see me and I'll kind of talk you through it and, and maybe walk you through your first week. Uh, next Sunday, we will be celebrating the education ministry at SCBC, so you will all want to be here uh, in the worship service. Eric Faraji will be, bring, will be bringing the message. Everyone is invited to attend the barbecue afterward. Please bring fruit or a dessert. A prayer group uh, meets every Wednesday night to lift up the cares and concerns of our friends and family. No special skills are required. You don't need to be a, a you know, a, a, a prayer warrior. Um, no special skills are required. All, we, all you need is a willingness to speak out to God on behalf of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, and lastly, Children's Church. We will be going outside to look for God, evidence of God. So girl, boys and girls, be prepared to come and do that with me. Thanks. Good morning, church. <laughs> I'm not Connie, but I'm going to take her place today. Um, so we are reading from Matthew 2, uh, verse... What is it? I don't have it written down here. 13? Uh, 13, 13 to 18. And that's on page 2 in the New Testament in your pew Bible. And it says, Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up. Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I have called my son. 
When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he was infuriated, and he sent and I'm sorry, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the Magi. Then what he had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice was heard from Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children, she refused to be consoled because there are no more. This is the word of the Lord. Every week as a church community, we have an opportunity to come together and to pray together, not simply as individuals, but as a collective body. And so I invite all of us to pray along with me as I lead. Jesus, we come to you today in both gratitude and confusion. We are grateful, Lord, to live in the country that we live in, And we thank you for the many blessings that you have given us. We are even more grateful, Lord, for men and women who have served this country, even individuals who have given their life for this country. They are wonderful models of your love. Just as you say, Lord, there is no greater love than this, than he who lays down his life for his friend. On this Memorial Day, Lord, we thank you for those who serve this country. Please bless them and keep them in the promise that one day all swords will will be beaten into plowshares. God, we also come to you today in sorrow and confusion. Shootings in California, shootings in Buffalo, shootings in Texas, shootings in New York City, Lord, we pray for the families of those who have lost loved ones. In unbearable anguish, Jesus, we ask you to be with them in their pain and to comfort them and to remind them that this pain is real and yet the the separation is merely temporary. Jesus, you have endured the same pain of an innocent death and through it you have opened a new door of hope. Give us eyes to see that the fundamental reality of your world is no longer death, but rather life has been unleashed and you promise to restore all things. Lord, I pray for all of us that the pain of this world might not overwhelm us in anger or throw us into despair or apathy, but rather through it that you might shape us into the kinds of people who can engage the pain of this world with love and compassion, Lord. Make us into that kind of people. And last, Lord, we pray for this community and we ask you to unite us with bonds of humility, that the nature of our love for each other might showcase the glory of your gospel. Lord, establish our deepest identity on what you have done for us. Jesus, we ask, that you be the lens through which we see this world and give us hope that one day tears will be overcome with joy. We pray this in your beautiful name, Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand with me as we sing hymn number 363, More Love to Thee.
Good morning, church. Good morning. morning. Our second reading will be from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 13 through 17. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamenting, a lamentation, and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children, because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping, and your eyes from tears, and there is a reward for your work says the Lord. They shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, says the Lord. Your children shall come back to their own country. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I had my entire sermon written somewhere between Monday night and Tuesday morning of this week. And then the occurrences uh, that happened in Texas that none of us can stop reading about and none of us can probably stop thinking or praying about. And I felt that in this moment that as a church we need to wrestle through um, what our nation seems to be going through right now. I think it's entirely appropriate to simply ask the question like where is God in a moment like this especially as you consider the tragedy of what happened in Texas with 19 students being murdered and two teachers along with them I think scripture invites us to ask this question where on earth is God when tragedy like this strikes and I, I think it's, it's really important anytime we ask the crucial questions of life to make sure that we begin our journey towards answers with the right initial steps. And as we begin this conversation, I want to make sure that we begin with the right two steps. And the first of which is this, is that the Bible is not an idealistic work of literature and it has no rose-colored glasses about the world that we live in. Its goal isn't necessarily to give us high aspirational truths of a God that we want to be or a world that we want to be. It deals with God as God is. It deals with the world as the world is. And the Bible invites us to ask these questions. In fact, I would say even deeper than that, the Bible affirms that such questions are good. Our pain and our struggling are good. As creatures made in God's image, we should struggle with such news headlines as we read them with increasing uh, occurrence. I think the first step we need to take is to simply understand that the Bible invites us in to ask these questions because it sees the world as it is. The second step I think we need to take is, is simply to admit this, that God is holy. And by holy, I don't simply want to refer to like a moral stance of God. Rather, I want to turn to the holistic idea of what it means to be holy in the first place. And that is to be holy other than, to be holy distinct, to be set apart. As God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts, so is God in his person different than we are in many ways. And it's entirely possible then, as we think through this question of where is good, for us to look at a problem and for God to look at a problem 
and for, uh, for the both of us to come with very different approaches and solutions to that problem. And this reality shouldn't actually challenge us in any way. I think this happens in almost every home throughout America on basically a daily basis. I, I have a, a friend who just moved into a new home. He paid way too much money for it, but he just moved into a new home. And uh, somewhere around week one or two, his wife was really sad that they didn't have more of their artwork and pictures on the walls. And so wanting to be a dutiful husband, he woke up at the, the crack of like six on a Saturday morning and he woke his wife up with the hammering thud of a hammer on a wall. And she comes downstairs and she has a cup of coffee and she looks and throughout all the house there are pictures up everywhere. And she says, well, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm, I'm solving the problem. And she says, no, you're not. <laughs> you're just creating a whole new set of problems. Uh, the wife was sad in this instance that more of the artwork wasn't on the wall, and yet I find it so, so interesting that the husband and wife look at the same problem, and yet they have very different perspectives on what the solution actually is. And with all the seriousness I can muster, I want that to be a framework from which we understand what is God doing in these moments when tragedy seems to strike. It is entirely possible that we look at the problem and that God looks at the problem and we come up with radically different solutions. And if you're a skeptic and you happen to say to yourself, well, God can't exist if evil like this exists. And the assumption is so goes something like this. If I was God, then I would do such and such to stop these things from happening. And since, since those things aren't happening, therefore God must not exist. I wanna push on that whether you're watching today online or whether you're here in person. I want to push on this assumption that because the solution you would like employed isn't employed, therefore God doesn't exist. Do you realize how arrogant that assumption is? It's arrogant in many ways. It assumes that we know far more about the world than we actually do. I would believe that few of us actually know how the plumbing in our house or our apartment actually works. We, we, we don't understand how our cars work half the time, and yet we have the audacity to believe that we understand all the complexity of the evil of the human heart and all the complexity of evil in this world, and we say, therefore, there must be a simple solution, and I have it, and because that solution isn't there, therefore, God doesn't exist. Are you kidding me? Like, that is an absurd statement to make. I think the Bible forces us to understand that there are simply no easy answers for this. And as I read through Matthew 2, and as I read the newspaper, I mean, there was just nothing for it. Today we're going to be talking about the slaughtering of the innocents that King Herod enacts in Matthew chapter 2. And at the heart of Matthew's wrestling with this tragedy is a phrase from the prophet Jeremiah about Rachel. And if you know anything about Rachel, she is the matriarch in Genesis who in the pain of childbirth gives her own life so that her son Benjamin might be born into this world. She gives her life so that a new promise and a new hope might be born into the world. And Matthew is asking us a question. Might this be the appropriate vantage through which to understand what God is doing in the world about pain and about tragedy? Jesus, I want to say, is a new type of Rachel who through tears, and pain and even death birth something new into the world. And so my sermon, as heavy as it is, is going to have two, two main points, points to it. And so if you are a, a note taker, you can take these, these highlights down. I want to talk about history and meaning, first of all. And then after that, I want to talk about hope. History and hope. And those are going to be our two points for today's sermon. So let's just jump into that first point, history. And so this is just how my brain thinks I cannot help it. And as I read lots of commentaries, a number of commentators simply step back and reflect on, on the fact that only Matthew deals with this story. Luke doesn't mention it. John doesn't mention it. Mark doesn't even mention it. Can it be true? And uh, many scholars, especially secular scholars, will look back at the fact that no other gospels account this, this incident. incident and that no other, no other incidents in Roman literature actually corroborates it. And therefore, they say, Matthew might just be making it up. And here, I want to I I push on that a little bit. That's not the way anyone does history. Most of what we know about the Roman world, or about the Jewish world, or the Persian world in antiquity, is through single attestation. That's all we have. 
Like history is not two plus two equals four. History is about developing systems of plausibility. And here I want to ask the question, is it plausible that King Herod would have done something like this? And we know quite a lot about King Herod, not just from the Bible, but from multiple sources, both Roman and Jewish. And this is what we can say for a fact. Do, do any of us know um, the, the, the story about Mark Antony and Cleopatra? Some of us probably do. They were lovers in Egypt. Do you know who one of Mark Antony's best friends was, one of his deepest allies? was King Herod. Did you know that? King Herod ran in amazingly powerful circles. And whenever Mark Antony was in need, King Herod that was there with armies and with food to support him. But do you know what happened when Caesar Augustus or Octavian marched with an army down to Egypt to take Mark Antony out? Do you know, what, do you know where King Herod was, that great ally? He betrayed his friend to his death. This is the character of the man that is being described in Matthew chapter 2. And we know more than this. There is a litany of murder in Herod's uh, CV. King Herod killed his wife, Maryam, or at least one, one of his ten wives. He killed his uh, great uncle, John Hyrcanus. He killed his brother-in-law, Costobar. King Herod killed three of his own sons. I want you to consider this. And this is, this is historically verifiable fact. With this in mind, I believe it's entirely plausible to claim that what Matthew is talking about in Matthew chapter 2 and the, the slaughtering of the innocents is actually a real historical event. But the reason I make that argument isn't just to make a historical argument. I want to step down one, one, one step further and begin to ask, what does this mean? What does history mean if this is true? If this is true, it means that Jesus was born into the same world that we inhabit today. And this is one of the reasons why I love reading scripture and why I think scripture still has answers for us today because it doesn't live in an, in an imaginary world. It lives in the real world where real tragedy and real death actually happens. What is God doing about the dictators of the world that want to send in the tanks to oppress a foreign people? What does God do about the Herods of the world that want to send in armies and persecute innocent people? This is a live question, not just for life then, but for life now. The Bible deals with real history. Jesus could very easily sympathize with every question that we have. And knowing this, the Bible still invites us to ask, what is God doing about it? And here, I think we get a very counterintuitive answer. Remember, God is holy. He's different than we are, and therefore the solutions that he comes up with are going to look different than, this, than the solutions we come up with. God's initial answer to what is he doing about the pain and suffering of the world is simply to be born into it and to identify with the people who are going through it. I mean, do you realize what this means for the identity of anyone who's ever been underneath someone's boot before? I mean, think about this. Like Jesus isn't a king who is for the poor. He is a king who himself is and has been poor and has uniquely experienced that. He isn't a king who's for immigrants. He is a king who himself has been an immigrant and understands distinctly what it, what it feels like, what it means to have that identity and to have that status. This, in my mind, completely revolutionizes the dignity of every human being on planet Earth because the king of creation can sympathize and, to, and, and can know the unique situations of each and every one of us. Now, you might say, a cynic might say, at least my, in my heart's cynical, so I often respond to myself as I talk back and forth. My cynical heart often says, well, so what? That, like, that's, not, that's not what a homeless person needs. They don't need to be identified with. What they need is money and they need resources. And here again, I need to check my own heart. Do I understand how absurdly that, that, that solution is mired or connected to a Western materialist mindset that says human beings are the sum total of their money and therefore if someone's struggling, all they need is money. That is such a shallow way to understand an answer to any problem. Like, I have worked extensively with homeless populations for at least 10 years, or I should say houseless populations for about 10 years. And I've seen quite a few 
poor individuals, men and women, claw their way out of poverty into a, a, a better lifestyle for themselves. And I guarantee you, and in every one of those situations, what preceded it was not someone just giving them money. It was an individual, whether it was a, a, a guy or a gal, taking off their suit coat, rolling up their sleeves, sitting down at a table with someone, and, and in humility, simply talking with them understanding what they're going through and not, uh, not assuming that they automatically know all the right answers for this person's life. Chances are that houseless person knows the problems that they're, they, they are in better than we do and therefore knows the solutions better than we do. What they need is, 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 not, is not for us to import our solution onto them. It's to understand them and to speak with them and to talk with them. And wouldn't you know it, that is precisely the first move that God does for us. He sees the violence of the world and his first move is to identify and to be with us. God's first instinct isn't to fix anything. It's simply to feel and to be with. And now you might say, well, what does that have to do with anything, Pastor Dan? Like, I'm struggling with the real tragedies of this week. What on earth does that have to do with the school shooting in Texas? And here I want to say fair enough. And so let's just engage with that. So let's transition now to my second point, which is hope. The, the slaughter of the innocents in Matthew chapter 2 isn't just a historical fact. It is a catastrophe where mothers and fathers were separated from the children that they love most. And scripture invites us to ask the question, what, what is God doing in these situations? He valued, that, that question is valid, and Matthew is trying to wrestle through it. And oftentimes, I have found this to be a helpful way to read scripture, that as I wrestle through a question, I need to look at the way scripture itself actually wrestles through the question. And I find it interesting that at the heart of Matthew's wrestling with this is a phrase out of Jeremiah about the matriarch Rachel. Let's just reread the text and then consider what Matthew's doing. And so I'm going to begin in Matthew 2, verse 13. I invite you to open your Bibles with me or you can just listen to me. But we're going to be in Matthew 2, verses 13 through 18. And this is how Matthew records it. Let's just read it slowly. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he became furious. And he sent and he killed all of the male children in Bethlehem and in all the region who were uh, two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. And Rachel, as I said, is a, a picture of a, a loving mother with her final breath giving up her life so that a child might be born into the world. Now, if you know your Bible or you know what Matthew's referencing, he's not referencing a passage from Genesis, which is where you learn about Rachel. He's referencing a passage from Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31. And this is, this is interesting. I want us to just pause and reflect on this for a second. He's reflecting on a chapter of scripture that is one of the most hopeful chapters in all of the Bible. I mean, it's, it's up there with Revelation 21 and Isaiah 66. It's about restoration. It's about joy overcoming anguish. It's about tears being wiped off the faces of, 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 of parted loved ones. It's about hungry bellies being full. It's about the full orbed restoration of everything that God wants to do in his creation. And yet at the center of Jeremiah 21 is this paradoxical statement about a woman giving birth to a child, losing her life so that something new can be born into the world. And I think here Matthew has been reflecting and pondering deeply on Jeremiah 31 as he's thinking about Matthew chapter 2. I think Jeremiah 31 15 and this statement about Rachel weeping for her children functions like a hinge. And I think the rhetoric of Jeremiah 31 requires us to ask a question. 
If Jeremiah 31 is this, beautiful op- is this beautiful door that God wants to open so that we can step into new hope and new promise, what is the hinge on which that door swings open? It's Jeremiah 31, 15. A voice is heard in Ramah and Rachel is weeping for her children. Matthew is painting a picture about what God is doing in the world despite the pain and the suffering that we go through. Where is Jesus in the aftermath of this school shooting? I think scripture clearly affirms that he is with them. He is with those in pain as someone himself who has suffered and died as a complete innocent. And now again, you might ask the question, how on earth is the life of Jesus, someone dying on a cross 2,000 years ago, how on earth is the gospel at all an answer to anything that we, we have gone through in the last week? And here I think I want to, again, come back to this idea that God is holy And the way he looks at the problem might just be different than the way we look at the problem. As we read the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, if we discern that the the biggest problem of this world is violence, then the cross is a very shallow answer for us. If we look out at the the trajectory of history and we discern that the, 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 the biggest problem facing us is simply murder, then the cross I mean, it's, it's just, it's not as satisfying an answer as we want. But if we look at all of these happenings and we see them merely as symptoms of a deeper problem, one that God has uniquely identified and put his finger on, then the cross might just speak to us a word of hope. What do we do when it's not just violence in the world that's the problem? What do we do when it's not just murder in the world that's the problem? What do we do when death and separation itself is the problem? The nature of reality is pointing each and every one of us towards death. Every father and every mother will be separated from their children at some point in time. Every child will be separated from their parents at some point in time. I want you to think of the person that you love most. And the reality of our world promises us that at some point in time, we will be parted from them. That reality breaks God's heart. He puts his finger on a deeper problem than any of us can see. And what does he do? He becomes the new Rachel. And in Jesus, he takes the pain and the hurt and the sorrow of the world into himself and as a woman in labor breathing her final breaths, he births something, he births something new into the world. A hope that that separation might only be a temporary thing. Jesus will identify with the lost. He will sustain the lost. And yes, he will even cry with them. And then in love and grace, Jesus will give us the promise that because of what he has done on the cross, that separation that we experience is merely temporary. And I think as Christians, this gives us a way to move on in hope and a way to be present with people in pain that we otherwise never, uh, uh, never would have been able to otherwise. Tim Keller tells a, an amazing story about a man that he knew very well at Redeemer Presbyterian Church. And he says this, this man went through a really tough time in his marriage and he just had a grumble in his heart for some months. His teenagers weren't doing what they want to be doing, you know, teenagers. His spouse wasn't doing what, she, what, 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 she, what he expected. And he went to bed most nights with just a grumble in his heart. And he said that one night he went to bed and he was just dissatisfied with everything. And he went, to, he went to bed and he had a nightmare that lightning struck his house and killed everyone in the house but himself. And he woke up from that nightmare in an absolute sweat. And he looked over to see his wife breathing and sleeping next to him. And he ran down the hall to see his teenagers like mouth breathing and snoring and just like disheveled in their own beds. And his heart burst with joy because he knew they were alive and he said, it was as if this, this momentary loss of my family made gaining them back that much more meaningful and that much more beautiful. 
Right? God's answer to the pain of the world might not be our answer, but it does give us a promise that is deeper than any answer that we might have. That the separation we have from our loved ones in Jesus is simply a momentary separation. And in my mind, this gives us strength, not just for tomorrow, but strength for today. Like, how, how do we present, prevent ourselves from becoming absolutely overcome by despair? How do we pre prevent ourselves from being absolutely overcome by anger and taking justice into our own hands? It's by understanding that what, what God did in Jesus 2,000 years ago has taken the sting out of that separation and taken the sting out of that death. We no longer operate out of the assumption that, our, that their departure is permanent. Rather, in Jesus, all things will be reunited. All things will be remade and be made new. And in my mind, that gives us both hope and a practice. It gives us the ability to be present with people in pain. Why? Because Jesus has taken the role of being our new Rachel. He sees the pain of the world, he sees the tragedy of the world, and he not only joins it, but he takes it into himself so that hope might be born out of it. And that now becomes our practice as Christians. We are people of hope. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that just as your wisdom is higher than our wisdom, Lord. So too is your love deeper than ours. And Jesus, I pray that as we wrestle with the, the world that we live in, we might find hope in you and the reality, Lord, that our departure from this world is but a, a, a brief, a brief glimpse, uh, departure, Lord. It, it is, it is a, a momentary dot in our story, Lord. And that you really are making all things new. And you are pointing the world back towards yourself. We love you, Jesus. And we're grateful for what you did. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right. We have an opportunity now to offer our tithes and offerings. And so I invite you to do that generously as we enjoy a wonderful offertory.
Jesus, please bless and multiply these generous offerings to expand your gospel, Lord, and to make your name great in New York and in Westchester County. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I invite us to continue to stand and to sing our final hymn, hymn number 210, Jesus Paid It All. for you today. We know the love of God because Christ has laid down his life for us. May we leave here as followers of Jesus, walking in his steps, loving in deed and in truth, and may the peace of Christ go with us. May that bless you this week, and may you enjoy your Memorial Day weekend. Go and have a wonderful Sunday.